My particular interest has been about Queensland's built heritage, in a sense, and, and the way Queensland's been shaped in a physical sense, and that's not just the, the sort of the, the bricks and mortar, but also the landscape as well, and, and, and the sorts of things that have shaped it over, you know, particularly since European occupation. How I heard about the John Oxley Fellowship, well, I knew it was around, um, and I'd, a couple of sort of friends had sort of actually been recipients of it in the past, and, uh, but uh, I guess I'd never thought seriously for a long time about ever applying for it, thinking, oh, well, what I was particularly interested in mightn't have been a subject of great interest for, for the John Oxley Library, or the State Library, anyhow, yes. Why should people be interested in the Great Artesian Basin? Because, I, th I think primarily because it's something that has actually shaped the development of Queensland um, in, in a way that's been really little understood. The thing that sort of drove me to sort of apply for the fellowship was that we knew the basics about it and the sort of the physics and the science really well known now, you know, I mean, scientists have been ex really sort of exhaustively exploring the Great Artesian Basin, but the social history and just how the Great Artesian Basin really shaped Queensland and Australia so little has been written about. And part of the interesting question problem was that because it, it was discovered sort of in the 1880s and very quickly sort of was very successful in drilling. And so by 1900, it was sort of very ho-hum. Everyone has artesian water. And so no one really then bothered to sort of follow up and keep writing about it. And I thought, well, actually, there's a lot of questions we, we don't really know the answer to. And some, some people have sort of hinted at what the reasons might have been, but it was to really explore just how it started and, and who the key players were. I mean, there was a lot of myths about that, and, and I've sort of tried to unravel that. Just some basic things about how did people actually drill for it and how did, how, how did they fund this incredibly expensive operation? Because that was one of the key things. And, and as I realised, is, is that the, the, the people that were able to drill, first was the Queensland government, because they, they saw there was benefit for, for towns to drill for their water. And then secondly, were, were pastoralists, and particularly those that had sheep. With, with this research, the intent is, is to publish a, a book. I think, I think it's important, that, and, and I, th I think there's sort of a market there, because I think the thing that's a bit surprised me about this, doing this research, I thought, well, it's pretty sort of dull, to, I, but, but I've been surprised at sort of the widespread sort of response to it and just how people have sort of, it's um, pressed some interesting buttons that of great relevance, um, and, and I think a greater awareness that, you know, we have what potentially is sort of something of, of world heritage status. You know, we think about the Great Barrier Reef as our, our great sort of um, icon, but this is something that's on that level as well. I mean, it's, it is the greatest artesian basin in the world. It covers 22% of our continent. It's just hard to sort of get our head around, you know. It's, um, there's enough water there for 60,000 Wyvernhoe dams. It's, uh, it's just very difficult to get our head around how, how important and how significant it is.